welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. I'm your host, Eric Champagne. I'm really excited about our guest today. I saw him a year or so ago on Shark Tank. He's got an amazing company that's disrupting the greeting card industry. You've probably seen him on Shark Tank or Inc. Magazine or Boston Globe or any other major media that's covering the things that his wonderful company is doing. John Wise, the COO at Love Pop, co-founder. Welcome to the program today. Thank you so much, Derek. I'm really, really excited to chat with you all. Man, I, I really appreciate you. I, I remember when I first saw, and I'm sitting here on my desk right now, I've got the Will of Love scene. I've got the card. I, we ordered it before this oh, interview. That's amazing. My team, we're, we're, we're a creative agency here. My team just fell in love with it. And I know that's just one of many amazing designs. And I remember when I first saw it on television, the first time, and I just, it was amazing to me that uh, Naval Architects, and with your background, then came up with this. So I've got to ask you, tell me a little bit about how you got started and just some early days and just any highlights you want to share that got you to where you are today. It's a really funny, kind of crazy thing that Naval Architecture like truly is relevant to creating these cards. Um, we, so I guess it, it really starts with me and my co-founder, Wambi have known each other for 10 years. We met in Naval Architecture School. Um, so it's been like a very, very long friendship um, that evolved into, into being business partners. We were traveling. Um, the style of card that we create is called Form Kirigami. Um, it's not brand new. Um, we are just the first ones using kind of cutting edge software and equipment to make way more of it and way more intricate designs. Hmm. Um, we, so we experienced like the similar artwork, fell, absolutely fell in love. That was the coolest thing ever. We were fighting over um, like using some of the cards we had found to, as our personal thank you notes. Um, and we went back to Boston, started designing. I was just like tinkering um, and I had actually looked in some of our other name architecture friends, too, and we were, like, tinkering, designing these cards. And people loved them. Mm. Um, people thought they were just the coolest thing ever. We designed a ship that was – it was actually the design by the founder of Web, where we went to school. Mm. Um, and so we had a ship. Everyone loved it. It was, like, Valentine's Day was coming. So we designed this heart, which is actually our original Love Pop card, um, which everyone loved. And – so it kind of it evolved into we're like, okay, well, this is fun to make, and people really like it. People are wanting to buy them from us. Like, okay, I guess we'll sell them. Um, and it started as a really just intricate or interesting kind of engineering challenge and, and fun like business to start on the side. Over time, um, things like the willow, and as we started creating more intricate, more elaborate sculptures and started seeing more people interact with the cards, we realized that we were actually hitting on something very different, um, which is just like the human need to connect. And kind of we, we over time realized the value of a greeting card is real and substantial. Um, like greeting cards have a place, but over the last 50 years, the traditional greeting cards that you see on the rack are just, they haven't changed at all. Like, th yes, they introduced music. That was novel for a little while. Right. Um, but it doesn't, it, it's not as impactful as it could be. Um, it's not as impactful as what we were seeing when people were engaging with, with our product. And not, not even engaging with our product, but using our product to engage with others and with the people that they care about. Um, and so that was uh, actually kind of, there is a, uh, a definite shift in, like, hey, this is a fun project to, like, this is a real business, and we are doing something really cool with it. There's, like, there is a, a double bottom line. There's a second 
reason for why we're doing this, which is to give people a medium to connect with each other. Tell me when it started to really take off. Now, obviously, you were onto something really cool. I guess you guys were traveling abroad and just fell in love with this concept, and that you were just doing it in, in a really cool way. When did when did you start to see traction? When did you realize I think we're onto something really big here? Let's take it to the next level. It took a while, um, and we I mean, so we were we were selling out of our backpack. Um, then we were selling online, kind of in like a hobbyist way. Um, we ran a Kickstarter, which was really cool. We designed holiday cards, and we're like, let's do Kickstarter, see if people like it. Um, <laughs> people, people, it was well received. Um, Kickstarter was a really funny experience because we put all of this time and energy into Kickstarter, had a successful outcome, which was awesome. Kickstarter ended, and then we were kind of left standing like, uh, okay, so now what? <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and it was like, you know, we sold all this stuff, we sold all this stuff, but like, how do we, how do we get? It's further out there. Right. Um, we opened a retail location in South Station in Boston in February of 2015, just last year, and that was that was also a big, like kind of the first turning point mm-hmm. um, when we saw the volume of people interacting with our product and being excited about us and purchasing and using it for engaging in their own lives. Um, and frankly, looking at the sales numbers, we're like, hey, wow, okay. This, this really could work, um, and this is really interesting and really, really cool. So that was, like, the big, the first turning point. We grew in retail, and then I think the next turning point was Shark Tank. It was our um, appearance on Shark Tank and the ability to kind of tell the country in the U.S. who we are, what we're about, what we're doing. We've interviewed guests on Shark Tank who did not get a deal, others who have, and you did the impossible and, <laughs> and and not the impossible got Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, really excited and actually multiple sharks, but he had a great built in distribution too, which is really exciting to me. It is. Yeah. No, he, frankly going in, he was not really on our radar. Um, we were looking at some of the other sharks thinking about how they could be really helpful. But as soon as Kevin in the tank started talking about Boston, <laughs> started talking about wedding, it was just like, it pretty quickly became clear that that he was the right partner, and we really haven't looked back. He's been he's been absolutely fantastic. What was it like for you in the tank? Did you go in expecting to get a deal? Did you feel confident that you would, or how did you feel going in? <laughs> oh, you have no idea. Um, <laughs> you, you really don't. You really don't know. So I mean, like we had we had had some investor conversations, and generally they're they're relatively casual. The stakes aren't that high. You're kind of exploring, and there are other investors you can talk to if it doesn't go very well. But, like, Shark Tank is a very different thing. It's a very defined time. You have one opportunity, and you are doing it in front of, you know, what will become the United States. Uh, and so, like, it's the, the level of stress and preparation and um, kind of an excitement is just is, is very different. Um, but it's awesome. And we didn't know we, – we were confident in our business. We were confident in ourselves. We didn't know, you know, what the outcome was going to be, but we, we knew well enough that it would be fine, and, and we were excited to kind of share our story. Um, and ultimately, they, it, it's been really, really great. What kind of shark tank effect did you experience after it aired? Oh, I mean, we had – so we, we aired at a very fortunate time, which was right before holiday. <laughs> um, and we have myself, you know, we are in a, a fairly seasonal business, so that was very, right. very good for us. But then also just like we got a lot of them bound, it really kickstarted our wholesale program, which has been awesome. Um, and then it also really kickstarted our the building of our wedding product, which is what um, Kevin really invested us and was excited about us doing and we've been working on. Um, and we'll be launching this year, which are doing customized wedding invitations with our with Love Pop pop-ups, um, which we've, we've done a couple and they are really astounding. So we're like, we're very, very excited to get that to get that out in a bigger way. That's really cool. You're a really sharp business person, sharp entrepreneur, but you're a smart cookie too. I've got an MBA from Harvard. How did that environment that you were in with school and with your contacts and your network, how did that help you in developing and developing this business in the early starts? Yeah. And I mean, Harvard for me was a tremendous opportunity. Um, I grew up in rural South Carolina. My parents were raft guides, um, and they now they've run a small rafting operation in South Carolina. So going to Harvard was kind of like, it, it was a dream from a, a young age. It was like, be something that would be really life-changing. And when I was there, 
the cool thing is there's just a lot of people who have done a lot of really cool stuff and are really willing and able to help. Um, I think that's one of my – you would ask me, you know, prior, like, think through some of the pieces of advice I have and asking for help and asking for advice and, like, find, seeking out people that have done this before has been one of the biggest things that I've had to learn and realize and is tremendously – has gotten us to where we are. It is tremendously helpful and has gotten us to where we are. And in not just Harvard, but in any school environment, um, having the diversity of people, whether it be professors or staff, um, and I think this doesn't even have to be in schools either. I think, it, you know, getting involved in your community and even us, like being involved in the Boston startup community, there are so many people that have done what you are trying to do in kind of different ways. Um, if you can find them and, and ask them for help, and, um, and it does go both ways. It's also, you know, you've got to give, give first and make sure you're giving help wherever you can, too. Um, but leveraging people who have done this kind of things before, you can grow and develop a lot faster. And so for us, like our community from school, our community from before school, our naval architecture community, um, and then the Boston startup community, all has been have played tremendous roles in how far we've come. I love that. And I'm seeing that more and more. And I really appreciate it. And me being a thick headed entrepreneur in my early days, I kind of thought you had to protect your ideas and go kind of do it all on your own and then showcase it when it was, when you succeeded. But I love this new cultivating of, of having consultants and having a great community around you. And I'm seeing the very great success case studies like yours that have leaned into their community. And, and I really love that. It's, we're not meant to be on an island. We are meant to lean into those who have done it better than us or who have paved the way and can share their resources and knowledge with us. Without a doubt. And then it is on, it is on you as someone who has figured it out to share wherever you can and to help others. And, and it, it, it will come back. It'll pay dividends to be helpful. So tell me a few other things you've learned along the way. I love that advice. What else just sticks out to you in your journey over these last couple of years? I think the playing into this exact same conversation, I was thinking a lot about uh, transparency and trust and kind of, how I've evolved as a manager and as a business leader and kind of getting to where we are now has taken tremendous um, transparency in ways that you don't expect. Um, there's like so many temptations, whether it's with your business partner, whether it's with your investors, whether it's with your customers or your team to hide some bad news or hide something that you're not quite sure about. Hmm. Um, it is like bringing it out in the open immediately just makes it not a thing. Um, and I, I, I think for me personally, that's something that has, I had to learn and has gone a really, really long way. Um, I think trust in others is, is similar, which is, you know, you're being transparent. You're trusting other people to be transparent in return. And, and generally it works. And kind of like you show a little bit of vulnerability and it actually can get you really far and get you a much better relationship with mm. kind of all of the different constituents that you're trying to balance. And it is really interesting. Like business really is just relationships on all fronts. That's great um, advice. Wow. <laughs> and if you think about like tactically, what are you doing? You're writing emails all day as business leaders, which are just cultivating relationships. The other thing I was thinking about, and one of the reasons – I, again, I'm getting personal. The reasons that I was excited about building a business and what's been most worried about building Lovepop is creating a really great place to work. Um, and I think that our, you know, your ability to build something great, to sell something great, to solve a big problem um, really is dependent on bringing the team together around you. And that really is dependent on creating an amazing place to work, an amazing environment to work where people are given the opportunity to learn and grow, are given real responsibility, are given the opportunity to laugh and have fun and build community within your workplace. And I think we've been very, very fortunate to create somewhere that's, that's really special and cool to work. Um, and that's been really awesome to see and also paid dividends and what we're able to do. Tell me how you deal with setbacks. How do you deal with, with challenges or what, what have you seen when you see a setback or a disappointment? What gets you through that? What, what helps you grow and learn from that? One, realizing that it happened. Hmm. Um, two, getting to the root cause is actually really important. Um, 
and I think, you know, there is something mentally, if you have an issue, uh, something happens, getting to an understanding of why helps gives you comfort that you can resolve it for the next time. Um, and so I think that's something that's really big for us is like, okay, this has happened. We'll deal with it. How do we make sure it doesn't happen again? And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, yes, and you write it off to learning. Because at the end of the day, like, we are all learning. No one is. Right. No one actually knows uh, exactly what to do or what to do. And a lot of, I guess, also business is, like, making tough choices. And you can't not make a decision. So you have to expect and understand that you will make some, some wrong ones. It's mm-hmm. just a matter of figuring out and understanding why and where you went wrong so that you can do better the next time. Great advice, John. Thank you. Let me ask you about balance and with, with the kind of schedule and with the kind of role that you have. H- how do you find a balance in life to where you have that kind of holistic satisfaction? Us entrepreneurs can relate to we find satisfaction in our work. We love it. It gets us up early. But then as I'm growing older, we say, hey, you know, we do have to have some balance and there's family and there's there's mental health and, and there's your physical health. What do you do or what advice do you have for having a balance in your life? I think this is is really a tough one. Um, I think having a partner who's supportive, I don't necessarily agree with like drawing boundaries, but I do think you have to watch out for yourself. Hmm. Um, I do think not stressing about the nine to five, but making time for yourself, your family, whatever you need, kind of when you need it. And thinking about, I think as an entrepreneur, there's not really an option but to think about your job as your life right. and to figure out the how how you balance it. But I don't try to frame it by taking it out of a nine to five context. It actually makes it easier to kind of find that. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting take on it. I like that. So tell yeah. me tell me a little bit about the possible project. Oh, for sure. So the possible project is a really amazing organization that we have been fortunate enough to be involved with from the very kind of very beginning of Love Pop. When we started designing these cards, um, one of my first thoughts was like, oh, my God, how cool would it be to do this as a high school program where the art department could draw drawings and the engineering department, teachers and students could, like, engineer these things. And they come together and make this, like, amazing product learning on learning kind of new software and yeah. new tools and technologies like laser cutters. Love it. Um, and then... Literally, this program emailed me, the Possible Project, um, asking to come talk to their students just about being an entrepreneur. So the Possible Project is an after-school program here in Cambridge um, that takes kids who wouldn't wouldn't necessarily go to, go to college, um, wouldn't necessarily have all the same opportunities um, as what could be available to other students, and they lift them up through entrepreneurship education. Um, and specifically, they focus on making things and kind of maker skills. I went and I talked to them for this class, and then I actually got involved, and we had a class of students um, that came to the Poplar Project after school and over the course of 12 months designed and engineered their own love pop cards. Wow. Um, and then we chose three of them that we thought were great, um, put them into our line, we actually had we had three classes go through it, and we have another batch of products that are coming out just in a few months um, that are student design products that that work with us. Um, we also work with them on developing a custom lines. So some of our custom projects that we do actually we develop and engineer and design those, and even go through the sales process with these students. Um, if you think about what, how life changing it is for a student to say, yes, I, you know, in high school in this after school program, I close five two thousand dollar deals. Right. Like that is a remarkable thing for a high schooler to be able to yes. say. And wow. so that's the kind of thing that we're working on the fossil project to do is to build a, a, a real business that provides a real value and service to businesses in the community, but also 
allow students to be involved and to see how real businesses operate um, and to give them real life skills. Yeah. So that's been, it's been a really, really phenomenal partnership um, mm. with them. Yeah, that's exciting. Thanks for sharing that. So I've got to ask you about the Donald Trump card because that one, that one cracked me up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've been asked about it a little bit, but you guys discontinued that, right? It was a, how did yeah, that how we, did that I mean, come about? We made that very early, very very early before when it still was kind of a, it was not really a thing. People were kind of feeling it out, and we thought it was hysterical too. Right. And so we made a um, Donald Trump, and then actually at the time. Um, these nuts was a another yes, um, yes. nominee in the Republican Party, and so we actually made two two cards and put them up against each other, um, and we thought it was pretty fun. That's, that's um, great. So, any chance you bring we, it back? We'll <laughs> okay. we'll see. I mean, well, I think I think what we ultimately learned is that well, Donald Trump is is pretty funny and and, and resonates with some people. Uh, a unicorn. <laughs> and a ruler tree is actually the pop up cards that people really want to buy. Right. So, that, that makes sense. So we'll see. <laughs> That's probably a smart move. Hey, John, anything else you want to share with us? Anything else that stands out that you can talk to our listeners about that are that are maybe at a crossroads or or, or developing a product and or just launching in the marketplace? Anything else that jumps out to your mind that you want to share with us? I think the um my last we really we've built a lot with very little. Um we are young and learning a tremendous amount. I would say if you have something you're thinking about, there's not really a better opportunity to learn and develop than to try to build build a business. I think when you are building a business or a new product, one of our biggest learnings is be careful with false positives. Um, we've had both false positives and we've had false negatives. It's a, it's a funny catch-22 because to build credibility and to get anything done, you have to sprint. You really have to move very fast on very little information. Um, but at the same time, do make sure you understand where your information is coming from and know when there are times when it is better to slow down and be a little more patient. Um, and we've we've seen the benefit from moving fast, but we've also seen seen some of the, the pain from moving fast as well. Wow. Man, John, thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate you being our guest today. I want to invite our listeners to learn more about your product by going to lovepopcards.com. They can learn more about some of your amazing designs, can order your products, can even learn more about the possible project. Thanks again for taking the time out of your day to, to share this with our listeners. No problem. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, John. Have a great day. You too. You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Take a five-minute complimentary marketing assessment for your business. Whether you're a startup or an established brand looking for more quality customers for your business, this confidential assessment will help you identify the next logical steps for appropriate marketing tools, strategy, and development for making sure your branding and marketing campaign is a success. Visit AssessMyMarketing.com today. That's AssessMyMarketing.com.